I love Liberty. I tell you guys, I wish so much that I would have had the chance to attend this school. When I came here the first time with Charles Billingsley and he showed us around, I said, this is like if heaven had a university. Like this place is amazing. And then we brought our family and we came and watched your first home football game. University of Florida, those schools, they have nothing on you guys. You guys are amazing. What fun, I'm serious, I know. A little biased, but. Sometimes people will say, what is that like spending so much time with people who don't technically exist? And I have to tell you that it's very conflicting because to me, the people I write about are real. And so not long ago, I was writing about a dear character named Ervil, who was very precious to me, sort of the grandmother I never had. But her time was coming and she was going to pass away. And I was writing slower and slower, not wanting Ervil to die. Finally, she passed. And so I took my laptop and I set it down beside my chair and I just had to have a good cry over losing Arvel. And just at that moment, my husband came running into the room, cheerful and upbeat. And he looked at me and he said, Karen, what's wrong? Arvel died. <laughs> he gets concerned, his, his face loses all the blood and he says, oh no, do we know Ervil from church or from school? She's one of my characters. <laughs> my husband rolls his eyes all the way to the ceiling and he says, well, I don't feel sorry for you. I mean, you killed her. I love that people think my stories are real. I spoke to Freddie in LU Praise and he said, I love your books, I read all your books. Yay, Freddie. <laughs> it was awesome, that was the coolest news to hear. But I love it because I see on Facebook, you're there with me and you're telling me how you have them on your prayer chain, so I know that you think they're real too. That's how it has to feel with those characters. But I'll tell you, you know, as students, you're reading stories about famous philosophers and church reformers, psychologists, and musicians. But one day, the story that will matter the most is the one that you are writing with the days of your life. One day, 10, 20, 100 years from now, people will look back at your story and what you want when you're at the end of that time is that people will say, there was a bestseller. They wrote a bestseller with the days God gave them. And to do that, there are three things we must remember. Because at the end of my journey, I don't want my kids to be at my memorial service someday saying, wow, you know, 50 books and bestsellers. I want my kids to say, she was our mom and she loved and she laughed and she found her life in Christ. And I look at those very important things with the finite number of pages that God has given us. And I think 1 Corinthians tells us to love and how love must be. And in the story of our lives, sometimes characters that God has put there are difficult to love. Maybe you're one of those characters in your family, or maybe you have a brother or a friend or a, a parent who's more difficult to love. But God calls us to love the characters that he has placed in our story. For me, my brother, Dave, was one of those characters. He was difficult to love. Dave had a temper. And at home, sometimes he would get so mad he could take a plate of food and fling it across the kitchen and break it against the wall. 
And my mom would just say, oh, Dave's just having a bad day. And the rest of us in the family would, would cower in Dave's presence and he was mean and he was angry and he never, ever wanted to hear about Jesus. But I felt God compel me to love him anyway and I never did it perfectly. But one day, the phone rang. Dave was 39 now, still living that rough life, still a difficult character in my story. And the phone rang and I hesitated. But again, I just felt God say, answer the phone, answer it. And so I did and in the background I could hear the song, I can only imagine by mercy me just blaring in his apartment. And he says, Karen! I said, Dave? And he said, yes, I found this song. And it's like I finally get it about God. Jesus loves me and I don't deserve it, but that's okay. And he said, is it okay if I go with you to church this weekend? I mean, I'm checking caller ID. Yes, Dave, yes, come. And he began coming to church and loving our family and laughing. Incredible. And I realized how important it is that we never give up on the people God has placed in our stories. That we would love well. Because by doing so, our story will be a bestseller, a beautiful piece of work. But we must also laugh often. Proverbs 17.22 says, laughter is good medicine. And the thing is, doctors didn't know when that was written, just how true those words were. For laughter is the only thing that works out your liver. Yes, and even though the liver doesn't show itself off, like in a bathing suit, it doesn't get a six pack. But it's important to have a good liver, so we need laughter. And we must laugh and we, as a family, we have learned to laugh as we adopted our three boys from Haiti. We laughed. It was amazing. And they were here for the football game. They all want to attend Liberty, I'll tell you. We laughed. And we laughed when we took a spring break trip back about 10 or 12 years ago. Ty was just a little seven or eight year old back then. And we went to SeaWorld and it was really important to me that as we got there and we fought the traffic because it was spring break and it was very busy. And as we walked in the gates, it was very important to me for some reason that we go to the 11 o'clock sea lion show. It mattered so much that when we got into the, the line, I realized we were not a light traveling group because our youngest, Austin, at two years old was in a front pack that my husband was carrying like a, a baby backpack, legs sticking out. That was my husband. And then I had a backpack that could have carried a house on my back. And it was one of those ones where we had sweaters in case we got cold. We had apples in case we needed a healthy snack and water bottles and sunscreen. And you name it, it was in the backpack. So I was kind of down like this and my husband was out like this. And we had Kelsey and Tyler, and we got in and we looked like nomads from a lost land, just making our way through the crowd. And we get in and I've got the map and I say, 12 minutes to the sea lion show. And the kids look over to the side and there is a park like you get for free in your neighborhood. And the children say, we must swing. And my husband who is often the oldest of the children. <laughs> said, yes, we must swing. And I said, we must hurry. We have so little time for fun. Fine, and we go over and the children begin to swing and enjoy the afternoon. And I am looking at my watch and tapping it and saying, we must hurry. And finally I say, enough. We must leave, enough fun. We've got to see the sea lion show. So the children with kind of bewildered looks on their faces 
begin to follow us and now it's more crowded. So now we are darting our way through the traffic, pulling the children, Austin's legs are flopping around on my husband. We get to the other side of the park where the Sea Lion Stadium is and the children see an ice cream kiosk. Fine, we get in line for the ice cream. Behind the counter that day were two Stepford teens on low battery. Very robotically, they would take a cone, two of them, put it under the soft serve ice cream, pull the lever, around and around the ice cream would go on the edge of the cone, never in the cone. <laughs> and when it would get so high, it would just flop onto the ground and they would watch it. <laughs> like it was gonna get up and get back in the cone. Then they would throw away the cone and grab another one and they were about one for three. I can hear the music, the show's beginning in the stadium next door. So we finally get our ice cream, we begin to run. One of the cones falls off and slides straight into my shoe in between my toes. I never broke stride, we just kept running. <laughs> Grabbed a bowl of ice cream for the cone and headed our way to the top of the stadium and looked down and I'm telling you, in California, the way they get a lot of people, <laughs> California, woo, Cal State Northridge, yes. In California, how they get a lot of people into a little space, they build their stadiums deep. And how they do that is a regular step and then a half step. Regular, ha I didn't know this. So we're at the top of the stadium, it's packed. Sea lions are already on the stage. And down about three-fourths of the way is one open row. I say, that's us. And I begin and I get my regular foot on the regular step and then I hit nothing but air. <laughs> and I began to roll <laughs> and tumble down the stairs and at first people thought I was part of the act. <laughs> I know this because I saw their video cameras. <laughs> and the sea lions all in unison went About this time, I realized that my backpack was unzipped. Because things were preceding me down the stairs. Water bottles and apples and sweaters. And I think that's when they realized I was not part of the act. Because you watch them go from rolling, tum and now they begin to stick out arms and legs, anything to stop me, but I'm rolling, tumbling. <sighs> She's got a good liver. <laughs> I finally come to a stop and I am right at my row. So I stand up and brush myself off and I look at the crowd and I wave them off. And you know, if I had a broken leg, I was fine at that point. So I stood up and I looked back up where my husband was still at the top of the stairs and I just went, Yeah. 
to which he released the children to gather our belongings. We all got in our row and I do not remember a thing about the sea lion show, except that partway through it, Austin, who was eating the chocolate ice cream from the bowl, sneezed. (laughs) And if you or your mother was that person in front of us with the white shirt, I I didn't say a word. (laughs) And when it was over, looked at my husband who, to his eternal credit, had not yet cracked a smile. And I said, so how did that look? (laughs) And he began to slither from his chair, laughing so hard, (laughs) tears pouring down his face. And when he could speak, he said, you you look like a sea turtle. In the story you are writing with the days of your life, don't take yourself too seriously. You've got to laugh, right? We love well and we laugh often and we find our life in Christ. See, Jesus wants to be the hero of your story. With him in our story, we have a guaranteed happy ending. Austin, our youngest, was watching Finding Nemo with me. Right? Classic, love that show. I was watching it for the first time with Austin. And I'm seeing it's getting sadder, sadder, sadder. And I'm looking over at Austin because he's got a really tender heart and I'm looking over and and he's kind of just, you know. I said, buddy, this is a a sad movie. I mean, he doesn't have his daddy. It's separated from his father. It's so sad. And Austin goes, well, mom, I mean, I've already seen it. It's got a guaranteed happy ending. (laughs) And I thought, wow, that's exactly, exactly how it is with Jesus. Wherever you're at, whatever chapter you are writing today in the story of your life, there's a guaranteed happy ending with Jesus as the hero in your story. Jesus Christ is the conqueror. He wants to be woven throughout your story that we would look back one day and see the thread of redemption and see what a bestseller that makes your story. John 10.10 says that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy and there will be those chapters. But he says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. My brother, Dave, when he was newly a Christian and realizing the joy of the Lord for the first time in 39 years, He came up to me one day at church. He was up front. He was worshiping, standing, and I saw him and I knew he was looking for me. And so I snuck up. He stepped out into the aisle and he he gave me a big hug. You know, he could say more with a hug than I could say with 100,000 words. And then he whispered in my ear and he said, Karen, I love you. Thank you for never giving up on me. That's the kind of story we want. We want a story where we love well and we laugh often and we find our life in Christ that the characters around us experience redemption because we are so rooted in Jesus Christ. My brother hugged me and held on a little bit more than usual that day. And it was the last time that I ever saw him. He went home from church and a few days later, he died in his sleep. I was so mad at God. 
I said, Lord, I didn't have a brother. All those years he was so mean and, and so angry. And now he was just starting to live. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yes, he was just starting to live, just not the way that you expected. And so Dave is alive and he is whole and he is happy and well in heaven. And today, on a tombstone in a beautiful tree-lined cemetery in Washington State. Yay, Washington. Read the words, David Kingsbury, I can only imagine. That's how it is. You cannot even begin to fathom how much your story matters. The things you do today, the way that you love and the way that you laugh and the way that you find your life in Christ, it all matters. I remember looking at Ty when he was maybe four or five years old and thinking how, how great it was that he could still run across the room when he saw me and open his arms wide and say, Mommy! I know, I'm embarrassing him, that's okay. <laughs> and he would jump up in my arms and put his legs around my waist and we would rub noses. <laughs> I'll hear about that later. <laughs> and he would say, I love you, mommy. And then I remember all of a sudden looking at him and he was headed off to Liberty. I thought, well, that's so weird. Like one day we did that for the last time. And I didn't know it. I didn't know it was the last time. Because the days of our lives, the pages turn so quickly. We only have that page for just a moment. And had I known, I, I would have thrown a party or I would have taken a picture or something to celebrate the last time that he did that. But we have lasts every day in our story and we don't know it. And it reminded me to appreciate the time that God has given me and to make my story, my life story, a bestseller. And in the process, I wrote a book. I wrote it for my kids. I'm going to read it to you because I'm pretty sure this is how your parents are feeling right now. The book is called, Let Me Hold You Longer. It's okay, if I see you wipe a tear, then it's all right. Nobody will look. Let me hold you longer. Long ago you came to me a miracle of firsts. First smiles and teeth and baby steps, a sunbeam on the burst. But one day you will move away and leave to me your past. And I will be left thinking of a lifetime of your lasts. The last time that I held a bottle to your baby lips. The last time that I lifted you and held you on my hip. The last night when you woke up crying, needing to be walked. When last you crawled up with your blanket, wanting to be rocked. The last time when you ran to me, still small enough to hold. The last time that you said you'd marry me when you grew old. <laughs> Precious simple moments and bright flashes from your past. Would I have held on longer if I'd known they were your last? Our last adventure to the park, your final midday nap. The last time when you wore your favorite faded baseball cap. Your last few hours of kindergarten, last days of first grade. Your last at bat in little league, last colored picture made. I never said goodbye to all your yesterday's long past. 
So what about tomorrow? Will I recognize your lasts? The last time that you catch a frog in that old backyard pond. The last time that you run barefoot across our fresh cut lawn. Silly scattered images will represent your past. I keep on taking pictures, never quite sure of your last. The last time that I comb your hair or stop a pillow fight. The last time that I pray with you and tuck you in at night. The last time when we cuddle with a book, just me and you. The last time you jump in our bed and sleep between us two. Last piano lesson, last vacation to the lake. Your last few weeks of middle school, last soccer goal you make. I look ahead and dream of days that haven't come to pass. But as I do, I sometimes miss today's sweet, precious lasts. The last time that I help you with a math or spelling test. The last time when I shout that yes, your room is still a mess. The last time that you need me for a ride from here to there. The last time that you spend the night with your old tattered bear. My life keeps moving faster, stealing precious days that pass. I want to hold on longer, want to recognize your last. The last time that you need my help with details of a dance. The last time that you ask me for advice about romance. The last time that you talk to me about your hopes and dreams. The last time that you wear a jersey for your high school team. I've watched you grow and barely noticed seasons as they pass. If I could freeze the hands of time, I'd hold on to your last. For come some bright fall morning, you'll be going far away. College life will beckon in a brilliant sort of way. One last hug, one last goodbye, one quick and hurried kiss. One last time to understand just how much you'll be missed. I'll watch you leave and think how fast our time together passed. So let me Hold on longer, God, to every precious last. Would you pray with me? Thank you. Father God, thank you for the beautiful, incredible students in this room. Lord, each of them who have experienced something like I just read about. Lord, I don't know what message you have for them, whether it's to bring you firmly and fully and finally into their story this morning, or whether it's to write that letter or make that phone call, or remember someone in their story who must never be given up on. But I pray that as they leave, they would remember that the bestseller that matters is not one that I would write. It's when they are writing with the days you have given them. And Lord, let their stories be marked with love and with laughter and with finding their life in you. We thank you, Jesus, and we thank you for this day and every precious moment in it. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, guys.